the strange little thing. My Uncle Harry was that kind of typical odd family that you get to see just often enough for them to sustain a kind of whimsical unreality. That strange breed of obscure relative that you'd easily believe came from another world. He wasn't necessarily my uncle per se, but some great uncle or a second cousin thereof through some labyrinthine genealogical politics that I was never able to peg down. In my mind, he existed in a place removed from my adolescent understanding of what the world was. It was pure magic to an impressionable youth. His sensibilities and mannerisms were my first exposure to the concept of a bygone era. I knew he was in the Second World War, and I knew that he'd traveled the world and seen more than most, but one thing seemed to shake him up more than the rest. It was a story he imparted rather reluctantly on the porch of his house, not more than a few months before we lost him to pancreatic cancer around the Christmas of 97. This tale that seemed to penetrate the ironclad constitution didn't happen in some entrapnelled, corpse-strewn Belgian trench or a Russian gulag. But right around here, by this modest rancher on Garner Lake, a few hours' drive northeast of Edmonton, Canada. I remember hours clawing up a gravel highway in an old pale mustard station wagon, the kind with the window that won't crank down and the groovy plaid upholstery. I was maybe nine at the time. It was 1986, and my family had made that trip more times than I could remember, probably only five or six now that I think back on it. The old man hacking an alder sapling out of the ditch in a stubbornly ragged flannel coat in defiance of the summer heat had stopped what he was doing as we trundled into the driveway. I would never describe Uncle Harry as an imposing figure. He was the eternal old fart, neither large or quick on his feet, but he still carried himself like a man who could tell a grizzly to shoo with the dismissive nonchalance one might affect to a cat sniffing the dog's bowl. And I'd bet money to this day that grizzly would listen. My Aunt Linda was resting dinner down in the cooktop just when we came in the door. My folks were hauling our bags with Harry bearing my unconscious three-year-old brother like a sack of rice, my aunt had a weird kind of superhuman timing. This matronly skill of hers was akin to advanced calculus and fluid dynamics, factoring the approximate velocity of the car, the weather, the general landscape of my parents' interpersonal dynamics, and the alignment of Saturn's moons she could time flawless Polish cabbage rolls to be ready as we walked in the door. Or they were just warming in the oven since six. She's dead now, so I can't ask. The house, which I figure was more of a glorified cabin, had a kind of hinterland charm that would be hard to get back to. It had history. Harry's family had bought the place just after he was born and pitied the man who tries to hunt down records of its construction. The old place was probably the first building hewn from that brown Albertan wilderness surrounding the lake. It was a 500-acre ranch once upon a time. The bulk of the land had since been parceled out, leaving Harry's family with a modest fortune. They had managed to extend this small cabin into a reasonable abode before their not unsubstantial savings met with the hard onslaught of circumstance. The original cabin is still there. It makes up the living room and the den, but the kitchen, the three bedrooms, front porch, and the attic were all scarcely 80 years old. Practically brand new. It was this attic that intrigued me. Up until this visit, I hadn't even speculated that it might be there. It had one of those pull-down trapdoor ladders. The whole rig had been made to blend in with the paneling. I'm assuming more out of aesthetics than secrecy. I probably wouldn't have known what I was looking at if I hadn't seen one like it in a movie. From the moment of its discovery, I knew it would take forces in excess of an aerial bombardment to keep me from exploring this new and hopefully perilous frontier. I had no reason to believe my trepidation would warrant any harsh reprimands, but there was still this exhilarating sensation that I was up to shenanigans. The hatch pulled down easily. An extendable ladder slid out towards me, and I caught it before it could clunk to the hardwood floor, waking my brother, who was, again, asleep not more than three paces from me. If he woke up, I knew the alarm would sound and I would be made. The attic stretched the length of the cabin and was well utilized. I had stumbled across what I could only assume was a gold mine of family history. Boxes, steamer trunks, an old cask big enough to crawl into. Some lamps, a dresser that must have taken a small crane to get up the stairs, and a smattering of suitcases. The dark recesses of this pharaoh's tomb both terrifying and wholly irresistible. There was a feeling then that I couldn't place, not at the time. It was some animal impulse towards what I couldn't have known, kind of how a salmon knows where to spawn or how a bird can navigate in bad weather. It was almost a hormonal drive towards a thing that needed to be witnessed, wanted to be found. 
The old steamer trunk wedged between two joists wasn't the most outwardly obvious thing in the room. In fact, I had to look past a stack of half a dozen banker boxes and a duvet in a garbage bag to even spot it. I had managed to clear a small pathway into the dusty corner, moving items with care and patience of a commando creeping up on a bamboo guard hut. Who knows what landmines lay in the creeks of the floorboards. The contents of the trunk were unremarkable. Old clothes, beaten denim, a pair of boots, and a cigar box. I didn't know what exactly had changed then. The darkness of the small space seemed to stretch outward, deeper than the confines of the attic. It became a wilderness. That sense of intrigue and adventure had been replaced by a haunting sense of cosmic predation. But that cigar box... I cut the brittle strip of masking tape along its edge with my thumbnail. It had yellowed over time, the adhesive crumbling like dandruff. Trinkets, keepsakes, a photo of a younger man with a horse, a Pepsi bottle cap, a bundle of flowers that were tied together with a string, and a faded red bandana in a tight roll. There was a smell then. I felt it at the back of my mind. It was an old cistern full of dead pets, a dangerous non-scent, a nightmare in a wet, cold place. I lifted out the wad and turned it over in my hands lost for a small eternity in that moment of pure strangeness. It unraveled like parchment, the cloth threadbare and stained. What fell into my hand in the stark glow of my flashlight was a rabbit's foot. It had since lost all of its hair, and the dry skin stretched taut over the bones was yellow-gray. Beyond that moment, I don't even remember leaving the attic. At some point, I must have put it in my pocket, closed the box, placed it back in the steamer trunk, climbed back down the ladder, and shut the trap door, but I can't for the life of me recall it. I was somehow so enraptured that the world was tertiary. I never let on about my morbid find, convinced the man would be concerned that I was disturbing the hoard of artifacts of his younger days. However, I got careless, and I'd left that strange little thing on the edge of my bed when my uncle walked past the door. He didn't even see it at first. Didn't even look in the door to my room. Had there not been something amiss, I fancy he would have gone right past into the commode and not said a word. But he just stopped as he walked by. His body stiffened only slightly. There was this primal awareness in him of something wrong, as if he caught a scent or heard a rustle in a nearby bush. He turned around to look at me. His face gave nothing away. Or was there fear? I was still at that age where I knew terror didn't exist for adults. When it showed itself in the subtle shaking hand and wavering voice, I couldn't see it for what it was. Now that's a strange little thing. Where did you find it? I couldn't quite place his tone. He wasn't mad, nor was he necessarily all right. How could I have been so stupid? I respected the man, and the guilt hit me like wet dog shit. I spilled my guts. He was an understanding man, never quick to anger or frustration. He seemed almost amused. Maybe part of him was even delighted in my fascination with the museum of his life. But he never looked away from the shriveled claw for more than a moment. Thinking back, it seemed to make him uneasy. In a moment of resolve, he produced an old handkerchief from his back pocket and grabbed the foot like a detective with a piece of crime scene evidence. Just an old rabbit's foot. His tone was wistful. In an uncomfortable amount of haste, it was wrapped back up, and he calmly hurried out. I was stunned momentarily. Then I darted out into the living room in time to catch him just closing the door to the lit wood stove. That interaction stuck with me over the years. And since that summer in 86, I had held other rabbit's feet. They didn't look the same. I didn't mean that they had fur on them. I mean, the shape was all wrong. They didn't look right. They didn't feel right, or it didn't feel right. Old Uncle Harry got older, and I'd still go visit. It was one of those clear Albertan nights on the porch, and he was well into another run-on yarn. That relic of a man sat in a timber chair with a wool blanket draped over his knees and a glass of scotch. Probably the third since we'd sat down out there. Could now be a good time, I thought. I took a chance then to bring up the thing that had always sat with me every time I visited since the summer of 86. I wasn't entirely shocked to find that it had sat with him too. So I feel weird bringing this up, I said. His gaze didn't leave the lake, but his eyebrows perked up in interest, so that was promising. But something happened back when I was nine, and I... His words cut me off, not harsh or questioning, just perceptive. The rabbit's foot. I was quiet. He took a sip from his glass, giving me a half-beat to breathe. Yeah. It came out as a whisper. For a time, I had thought he would dismiss the conversation. If that happened, I felt that I would have been unable to bring it up ever again. He would carry it to his grave, and I would have to accept that. But it seemed the man was too old to care enough anymore. He took a hard sip. A curious little thing. <sighs> a strange little thing. 
I listened, afraid to breathe too loud for fear of ruining the moment that I'd spent the better part of a decade working up to. When I was a younger man, about your age, maybe a bit older, I'd come back from the war not much earlier. There were four of us that would get together then and go out hunting. He stared off into the middle distance where the recollection hung. I had known he hunted, several sets of antlers and a stuffed fox that had visibly seen the years were mounted in the living room. There was Mitch Cooley, Tom Salzburg. Tom's fiancé had an accident in the spring of that year. Fell off the dock and drowned. So close to shore, too. They figure she must have hit her head on the way in. As if that wasn't bad enough, the coroner had said she was pregnant at the time. He shook his head. That's terrible, I said under my breath. He nodded. A lot of people in town were suspicious, of folks blaming Tom for not being there. Others thought that maybe he'd done it himself. Nobody would outright accuse him, but the word used to move in a place like this. We figured with all he's been through, he could use the trip. We rode horses a lot back then. We'd go off for a weekend into the hills, around the ranch, and bag ourselves a cup of deer. It was never that great of a shot. Hell, the damn dog caught the fox in the front yard, so I got it stuffed. He seemed to catch himself digressing. Anyhow, this time we're poking around for a flat place to camp before the light goes out. Up here in the summer, the daylight hangs on for a time, but it was getting late. We tied the horses up to a birch tree, got a fire going. Tom had a specialty dish that he was proud of. A lot of beans and flour, maybe a rabbit if you were lucky. I don't even remember what it was in it. It looked awful. We called it Tom Old's Shoe Stew. We were ribbing on him, but I'd be goddamned if it wasn't plenty edible. Sat in your guts like cement, but it did the trick. His tone had been getting more upbeat as he went on, but the dark cloud of that uncomfortable recollection was back. Later in that evening, the horses started acting all weird. They looked agitated. Something in the dark just past them had set them off. Cooley and Mitch went over to try and settle them down. Tom and I went for a rifle each. See, horses have amazing hearing, you know. I knew. So we're listening for anything out in the night. Eventually we hear some movement in the bush off to our left. It didn't sound big enough to be a bear, but around here even a hungry badger could be mean enough to do some damage if they had a mind to it. Then there it was. This ugly, strange little thing. We didn't shoot. Not right away. It didn't look like it could do any harm. It's about the size of a small dog. Hairless, pale, sickly, and not long for this world. Tom figured it was a bald raccoon. None of us had ever seen a bald raccoon. But there weren't even any raccoons around here. Mitch figured maybe it was a starved pig. You know, he says, like it came out all backwards and couldn't feed itself too well. But that was wrong. No matter how skinny a pig gets, they still have hooves. For one, this thing had these twisted little claws. Cooley chimes in, figuring some oversized barn cat, like something that had a streak of wildcat in it from somewhere down the line. Says it must have been caught in a barn fire and barely escaped, but it was covered in one big scar and that ears and tails had been burned off. I grimaced at the thought of this grotesque wretch. I was smart enough to know then what I didn't know, and I didn't have a damn clue what we had found. Well, what found us, I suppose. I felt chills. I had seen a cat's skull under the porch once, and this thing's gross skin was stretched so tight over its bones it just... He shook his head. Its eyes were off, too, those deep, sunken sockets like a cold firelight reflecting off the bottom of a well. The horses didn't like it. We hollered and stomped and told it to get, but it just took us in with those weird eyes. It seemed to pause on Cooley just a little longer. Then it rattled off into the darkness. It moved weird, all stiff and dry. That was almost the spookiest part. We'd all figured it left us and gone off to be coyote chow if there was any coyote desperate enough to eat that awful-looking thing. Now, old Cooley didn't let on, but we knew that it had spooked him more than the rest. We didn't really talk about it until we went to go ready the horses the next morning. I saw Cooley's horse was favoring her back leg. Looked like something had bit it, over and over, just turned it into a ragged mess. The rest of the boys were all quick to blame our little friend from the night before. And talking amongst ourselves, we didn't notice when it returned. Didn't have the slightest clue until it had wandered right into the camp. Even the horses were caught off guard. Cooley's especially just lost her mind. She started rearing up and hauling at the rope. We tried to calm her down. Mitch had his rifle up to the strange critter, and Tom was yelling to shoot the ugly thing. Mitch 
put a bullet right into its flank, just as the horse broke loose, knocking Cooley aside as it bolted in the forest. Now that shot should have turned its insides to soup, sent the critter tumbling back a couple of feet. Then the goddamnedest thing. It got up. It got back up. We all saw the hole where Mitch had plugged it. Neat, dry, and black as tar. That shot would have taken down a moose. We figured it mustn't have hit anything vital. It just stood there and leered at us, like it had no intention of running away. He shot it again. This time it stayed down. I couldn't help but think that maybe this time it was by choice. Harry was silent for a moment, incredulous of his own account. Admittedly, the disbelief prodded at me. True or not, the recounting was having a weighty effect on the old man. Well, Cooley was moaning on the ground. The horse had smashed his collarbone. Tom and I helped him up to his feet, and Mitch jogged off to go find the horse. But that thing had gone. They'd gotten out of the stables before and could find their way back home, but Cooley's horse, she never turned up. Probably stepped in a dog hole and died lame. So while Tom is loading Cooley's gear and the three other horses, I'm propping up Cooley, who by this time is green and going silly from the pain. Mitch goes over and picks up the dead critter by one of its gangly legs. I ask him what the hell he's doing. Says he's keeping it. Got the thing held up in front of him like some awful trophy. He looks over his glasses at me. Now the thing about a strange, squirrely character like Mitch is he's bound to know other strange, squirrely characters. See, Mitch had this cousin, a fairly savvy amateur taxidermist by the name of Stanley Cardew, who lived on an adjacent property. He said that name with an air of significance. Why do I know that name? I asked. I had figured it was safe to interject this far into the story. You heard of the Bulrush Hill homicides, yeah? I had. It was one of the more upsetting crimes of rural Alberta in the last hundred years. They found the remains of at least eight bodies, mostly children, mixed in with all the animal bones and innards in the forest out behind a... A taxidermist, he finished. Mitch's cousin was that taxidermist? He nodded. Sad truth of it was, seeing as most of the bodies were from the Indian Reserve, the government didn't have much nevermind for the affairs of those folks back then. It wasn't until a local girl went missing, about five clicks down this road, that the investigation led them to the Cardew house. Couldn't find thing one to get him with. The place was spotless. The fella genuinely acted aloof. No real reason to suspect him until one kid, this young detective, started poking around in the cast-off meat out back. I grimaced. My uncle waved it off, determined to get back on track. Anyhow, Mitch has it in his mind that he wants to get this thing stuffed, so he pulls out a bowie knife. So you have to take the guts out or they start to go bad real quick. Another long pause as he held his hand up. My hand to God, when he cut into that, its guts came spilling out as yellow-black as molasses and smelling like a hot sewer. I could see this recollection was upsetting him. But by this point, he was determined. Now Mitch had that thing for years. Then Cooley's 40th birthday, he gives it to him as a gift. Wrapped it up with a bow like some grotesque pageant queen. He seemed happy to be rid of it. This was probably only a number of weeks before Mitch passed away. Uncle Harry sighed. Cooley died a couple of months after that. Just struck out at the dinner table one night. It was a vegetable for months before they took him off life support. They said it was a clot. Complications from his old collarbone injury. One in a million chance. His wife, a real timid thing, didn't want the pastor talking about his time in the war. Us boys all knew old Cooley was haunted by something. Maybe haunted isn't the right word. I don't think it was that post-stress dysfunction or whatever it's called. He'd done things over there he just couldn't talk about in the civilized world. We all did things we weren't proud of, but we knew Cooley was a special case. Anyways, that creepy stuffed nightmare ended up going to Tom. Left it for him in his will, explicitly, which was odd. What with his death being more or less sudden and at too young an age. A thought had been tickling the back of my mind. It wasn't enough to entertain just then, but it gnawed on me, like an ugly thing chewing on my leg. I felt like I knew what was about to happen. Tom had it in his den for a couple of years before he went missing. That gnawing sensation had turned to ice. Most of his family had been by the house looking for him. About two months after he disappeared, his niece was walking around out front of his house, and she finds what was left of old Tom, fish-eaten and white, bobbing in the reeds under the dock. This last part was barely a whisper. He paused for a long minute to stare at the water. So long that I thought he was done talking for the night. I never asked for it. But his niece was handling his affairs, 
and none of their family would take that, that strange little thing. So one day, his niece, she drives here with that thing in her car, brings it to the front door. She doesn't say a word the whole time. It thrusts it into my hands. She looks tired and spooked. I didn't even have a chance to ask what was wrong before she was back in her car and tearing off fast as hell. Well, I stuck it in the box, stuffed it in the cupboard in the den. It lived there under a stack of books for years. I all but forgot it was even there. Your aunt never forgot about it. She didn't like having it around. Said it soured the air just knowing it was in the house. Kept trying to get rid of it, but I was reluctant. God knows why. It had belonged to a good friend. Hell, three good friends, but I was never fond of it. One day she's fed up and goes to dig it out from under that stack of books. Oh, and cracks her head, just something mean. She was frustrated at me at the damn thing and caressing a goose egg over her eyes, so I just did it. I went to go throw it in the fire. Before I did, some compulsion took over me, and I grabbed a pair of these clippers, you know, the kind you'd trim the roses with, and I snip off one of its front feet to keep and toss the rest of it into the stove. That thing, it seemed to twist and writhe a bit. I guess the stuffing inside burning up. Crazy as it sounds, it felt like that thing was turning around to look at me before I slammed the door. We didn't speak. I thought about the odd circumstances surrounding the young men, and how the world was further apart back in that time. How people could get away with some horrible things a lot easier. I thought about that serial killer Stanley Cardew, who, till his death at the hands of prison guards, claimed he never killed nobody. I thought about a young, pregnant fiancé out for a walk by the lake with a future husband who may or may not have been keen on raising a child that wasn't his own. I thought about a young private separated from his battalion in a bombed-out town, maybe in France, and not for the first time, searching for survivors for target practice. How did Mitch die, I asked. He drew in a rattling breath. I felt like he was trying to impart a horrible, impossible truth, one he believed but couldn't accept. One he'd been trying to say without saying. It was a heart attack. His wife found him in the night, naked and propped against the wall. They say it looked like he died while trying to load a revolver. No sign of a break-in. The doors were all locked. Wife said it looked like he just got scared. My aunt called through the back door at us that dinner was ready. My uncle hoisted himself off the chair, considered his empty glass, and, looking at me, tipped his head towards the screen door. I'll be in in a sec, I said. I made no motion to move, just looked out at the lake for a long moment. Something barely illuminated by the porch light off in the trees caught my eye. Only for a split second. It was probably a coyote. Maybe a bald raccoon. I knew it couldn't be here for me. But I found myself wondering what horrible things my uncle had done.